And it is hard to believe, but we have been in the book of Hebrews for about five months on Sunday evenings. And tonight, we wrap it all up. So if you will turn to Hebrews chapter 13, verses 20 through 25. Now you know that I almost always preach in series. Might be a topical series, it might be a series through a book of the Bible, but I almost always preach in series. And so when we come to the end of a series, I kind of have a mixed bag of emotions. Because I've spent weeks, and in some cases months, studying and praying and thinking and writing and preaching through these series. And so when we end a series, it's kind of like saying goodbye to a good friend. But it's a mixed bag of emotions because I'm also excited about the next series that we're going to go into. And you'll notice on the flip side of the outline, starting next Sunday evening, we begin four Sunday evenings looking at names of God. And I've been thinking about that, and I've been getting resources for that and praying for that. So I am very excited about that short series. And I would encourage you, be here for that. Invite church members to come on Sunday evening. Invite guests to come on Sunday evening with you. But if you're there in Hebrews chapter 13, let's read verses 20 down through the end of the book. Now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will, and may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, I urge you to bear with my word of exhortation, for in fact I have written to you quite briefly. I want you to know that our brother Timothy has been released. If he arrives soon, I will come with him to see you. Greet all your leaders and all the Lord's people. Those from Italy send you their greetings. Grace be with you all. We're calling this message this evening, Signing Off and Summarizing. And in verses 20 through 22, he summarizes what this book has been about. The author of Hebrews has just asked the readers to pray for him. Maybe you remember that. Back in verses 18 and 19, he asked that they would pray for him, that he would live a holy life, a godly life, a pure life, a clean life. And then he asks that they would pray that he would be able to come and visit them soon. And now he turns things around and he pens a prayer for them. And in this prayer, he summarizes the book of Hebrews. He says here that the God of peace has established a new eternal covenant through the blood, through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And the God of peace means the God of reconciliation and also the God of contentment. This new covenant through the blood of Jesus Christ reconciles us to God. God reconciles us through the death and resurrection of Jesus. We know, the Bible says, that our sins separate us from God. Our sins distance us from God. Because God is a holy God, he must remove himself from us as sinners. And there's no way that we can walk our way back or earn our way back or work our way back to God. And so God, in his grace, has lowered himself and humbled himself in order to come to earth in human form. And in doing that, he built the bridge to us. And the bridge is the blood or the death and resurrection of Jesus so that we can be reconciled to him. And this has been what so much of this letter to the Hebrews has been about. That Jesus is superior to the old covenant. That Jesus is superior to the law. He is superior to Moses. He is superior to the animal sacrifices. He is superior to the angels who delivered the law. He is superior to the old covenant priesthood. So the God of peace means that we have been reconciled to God, but it also means that since we are reconciled to God, we can have contentment and joy. And just think of what that means to these first readers 
of the letter of Hebrews, who are suffering so much pain and persecution and difficulty in life, and the author reminds them that because we are in the new covenant, because we have this new way of relating to God, because we are under the blood of Jesus Christ, we can have joy and contentment no matter the circumstances of our life. And all of this, he says, comes through Jesus, who is the great shepherd. The great shepherd, it says, who provides us with everything we need for doing God's will and pleasing God. Now, we are used to hearing about Jesus and talking about Jesus as the good shepherd. And the good shepherd emphasizes the character of Christ, that he is loving and gracious and kind, that he watches over us and protects us and provides for us. But here it says that Jesus is the great shepherd. And that means something different. The idea here for the great shepherd means that he is big and he is mighty and he is powerful. And as the big, mighty, powerful shepherd, he provides us, his sheep, with everything we need to live a godly life, everything we need to do what pleases God here and now. It means that Jesus is the one who brings us to God and keeps us near to God. It means that Jesus is the way maker. Sometimes we sing that, way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. He brings us to the throne of God and he keeps us in front of the throne of God. And it says here that the great shepherd equips us with everything we need. That word for equips is ketartidzo. Now, that, that's a word we don't know. But the original readers of this letter would have understood that word very, very well. It was a word that was used in medical writings to talk about the setting of a broken bone. It was a, a word that was used by fishermen for the mending of a net. It was a word that would have been used by sailors for uh, the providing all of the supplies for a voyage. It's a word that would have been used by soldiers for equipping soldiers to go into battle. And it says here that Jesus provides everything we need in order to do what pleases God and to live to his pleasure in this life. Now, how does the great shepherd equip us? Well, if we follow this word, ketartidzo, through the New Testament, we see some of the different tools that the great shepherd uses to equip us. First of all, he uses the word of God. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped, katartidzo, for every good work. He also uses the tool of prayer. Night and day we pray most earnestly that we may see you again and supply what is lacking, katartidzo, in your faith. He provides the fellowship of the local church to equip us. So Christ himself gave apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip his people, Kedartidzo, for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. He provides individuals to come into our life to help us and to heal us. Galatians 6.1, brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently, but watch yourselves or you may be tempted. The idea of restoring is the word katartidzo. And another tool that he uses is pain and suffering. And the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you, katartidzo, and make you strong firm, and steadfast. So, in this prayer, he has given us a summary of the book of Hebrews. It's about God providing us with a new covenant, a new way of relating to God through Jesus Christ. 
And Jesus is not only our Savior, but he is our great shepherd who provides all that we need to live our lives to the glory of God here and now. But he continues this summary. He says, Brothers and sisters, I urge you to bear with my word of exhortation, for in fact, I have written you quite briefly. Now he says he's written them briefly. You might not think so since we've been in Hebrews for five months. But you can sit down and read the book of Hebrews in less than an hour. The book of Hebrews is shorter than the New Testament book of Romans and shorter than the New Testament book of 1 Corinthians. It has less than 10,000 words. And he summarizes this as saying, this is his word of exhortation to them. And that word exhortation means comfort. Comfort. So the book of Hebrews is written not to cause people to fear God, not to frighten them into staying with Christ, but it is written to encourage them to remain faithful to Christ. Now, are there some parts of the book of Hebrews that are difficult and kind of hard to hear? Yes. But he says to them, I urge you to bear with my word of exhortation. And what that means is he, he wants to emphasize to them that this book of Hebrews in their situation is so important that they not put it on a shelf, they don't ignore it, those difficult to hear parts of it, they don't allow that to cause them to, to ignore this book, but rather they take it seriously and they understand all that is at stake. And so he tells them, remain faithful to Christ in the midst of your suffering and don't look back. Well, then in the last few verses, he signs off. He signs off. And he tells us that if Timothy comes to him in time, because he's just been released, that the author and Timothy will come to visit them. Apparently, Timothy had been in jail probably for preaching Jesus. We don't know for sure. But uh, what I find interesting here is that the author wants to come and see them in person. Even after he has spent 13 chapters telling them everything he feels he needs to tell them. And what I see here is that the author of Hebrews understands the importance of the ministry of the word and the importance of personal ministry. Over and over in the New Testament, we see this two-pronged approach to effective ministry. The preaching and teaching of the word, that's necessary. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. But also the idea of being with people and ministering to people in person. The book of Galatians says that we are to bear one another's burdens because when we do that, we are fulfilling the law of Christ. In other words, by coming alongside one another and walking with each other and helping each other and encouraging each other and carrying burdens and praying for one another, we are treating them with Christ-like, godly love. And the author of Hebrews knew this balance. He knew that both were needed the ministry of the word, and personal ministry. If you like to teach the word, that's great. Teach the word, but don't neglect personal ministry. And if you enjoy personal ministry, you like to call on people and spend time with people, that's wonderful, but don't neglect the teaching of the word. And then he wraps things up here. He asks them to greet all of their leaders and all of the Lord's people. And he says, those from Italy send you their greetings. I think what happened was that there were some of these Christians who had traveled to where the author was, and they shared with him the battles, the difficulties, the, the persecutions that the Jewish believers were facing. And hearing that story is what motivated the writing of the book of Hebrews. We know that in 49 AD, the emperor Claudius expelled many of the Jews and Jewish Christians from Rome. And historical writings tell us 
the Jews and the Christians were kind of lumped together because neither of them would bow their knee to the emperor. And so they were expelled from Rome. And specific writings tell us that the Jewish Christians were chosen because of their resistance to the emperor and the worship of the emperor. Well, Claudius expelled them. And when Claudius was murdered by his wife, who was the mother of Nero, and Nero became emperor, many of the Jews and the Jewish believers decided it was time to go back to Rome. <laughs> Talk about going from the frying pan into the fire. Okay, they, they left Rome because of the persecution under Claudius, and when he was gone, they thought it was a good idea to go back to Rome, and then they faced the persecution of Nero. And so these Jewish Christians were not only being opposed by the Jews because they rejected Christianity, but they were being persecuted by the entire Roman Empire and the emperor himself. And so that's what motivates the book of Hebrews to be written. They are under intense persecution and pressure and suffering. And some of the Christians come to the author and tell them about what they are experiencing and how many of those Jewish believers are thinking of rejecting Christ and going back to Judaism to try and make their own lives more comfortable. And then he says, grace be with you all. Now, as we wrap up, I think there are three lessons that we need to take with us from the book of Hebrews. Lessons to remember. Number one, following Christ might be costly and painful. Following Christ might be costly and painful. So don't come to Jesus without counting the cost. Lesson number two, but God can redeem that pain and suffering. As we have seen throughout the book of Hebrews and as we see in other places in the New Testament, God can use that pain and suffering to grow us in Christ. Now that doesn't mean that we should try to suffer for our faith, but it means that when we do suffer for our faith, we can take comfort in knowing that God is allowing that because there is a purpose in it. And then lesson number three. So don't consider leaving Jesus. If and when following Jesus gets hard, don't consider leaving Jesus. Because you can know He loves you, He is with you, and all of His promises for your future are true. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for these past five months that we've been in this book. And I pray that, uh, that we've uncovered some things that maybe we didn't see before, that we've been reminded of some truths that maybe we had forgotten, that we have been challenged by some of these writings by this author. And Father, I know that the persecution, the discomfort that we sometimes feel as Christians is nothing compared to what these Jewish believers were experiencing or what the persecuted church around the world is experiencing now. And yet I also know that, that there are some believers here, now, who think about leaving Jesus and going back to their way of life before Christ. Father, I pray if that's in the heart and mind of anybody here tonight, that they would rethink that they would understand that there, there really is no turning back because it's, it's leaving what is superior and going back to what is inferior. It's leaving the light and returning to the darkness. It's leaving life and going back to death. I would pray, Father, that through this study, we have been encouraged in our faith and in our faithfulness. In Jesus' name I pray.